With Botox used on the rise, many people use the outpatient procedure without getting the proper information they may need. Dr. Edgar Fincher gives us more information in this week's Health Beat. Botox um, actually works on the muscles. Okay. So we call them muscles of facial expression. So the muscles used when you smile, okay. when you raise your eyebrows, when you squint. Um, <clears throat> and it can actually uh, chemically weaken those muscles is, is essentially the way it works. Um, as we use these, these muscles over and over thousands of times a day, what happens is you're really compressing the skin, overlying the muscle. And over time, what happens in that, in that compression area is, is you form a line, mm -hmm. you form a wrinkle. Okay. Um, so what the Botox will do is, uh, it's, a, it's a simple injection in the skin. Okay. The chemical itself actually gets into the, the nerve endings that control that muscle, weakens the muscle, relaxes that muscle, so you're not really forcefully creating that line again. I mean, I think the, the overall goal should always be to, to enhance one's natural self okay. and not to overdo it. So I think these procedures are straightforward. I think they're simple. Um, there are always potential complications with anything. They're injections, so right. obviously the needles need to be placed in appropriate places. With the, with the Botox injections, they're really, as we said before, very straightforward injections straight into the muscle. So it's just a series of small injections. It could be four injections or across the forehead, maybe it's 10. Okay. Um, I usually have my patients ice afterwards okay. just to minimize any swelling at the injection points and prevent any bruising. Um, there's no bandaging, okay. so there's no bandages that we use, but we do ask that people refrain from um, you know, strenuous exercise or lying down for a period of several hours just because we don't want the, the substance, the liquid there that we've injected to migrate to other places. We really want it to stay right where we've injected it. Sometimes there's bumps. There'll be little tiny bumps because it, it is a liquid, a solution that we, we inject in there and you get a tiny bit of swelling just from the, the puncture. But that really dissipates and goes away in probably a matter of, of an hour, especially with some ice afterwards. Best thing to remember is, is um, to avoid any blood thinners or uh, mm -hmm. aspirin or ibuprofen, um, you know, any medical blood thinners, these types of things before because it just increases your chance of maybe getting a little bruise at the injection site. And remember, it's always recommended to consult with a medical doctor before having any cosmetic procedures. The Terranea Resort received an award from the South Bay Business Environmental Coalition for going above and beyond to stay environmentally friendly. Mark J. Dotty tells us more in this week's Green Beat. From the beginning, Terranea Resort understood the importance of maintaining the environment. Their efforts were acknowledged at the South Bay Business Environmental Coalition's SEED Award Ceremony, which took place in the Redondo Beach Performing Arts Center. Many city officials and staff were there to support Terranea. We are so pleased that Terranea won this award, the South Bay Environmental Excellence Development Award, uh, SEED Award. They um, won it in the category of pollution prevention. They are an excellent partner with the city uh, and they are an environmental steward and uh, want to do their best to be a good partner for, with our city and for um, California. And they're good friends of the environment. It's a great honor for them to have the SEED Award and they, greatly re, re, they, they really deserve it. Terranea originally started off uh, with a project uh, um, called Long Point. It went through a lot of uh, maturations. Uh, there were certain elements to it that the community didn't care for. They wanted to use a public park at the upper point for Seni. Anyway, it eventually evolved into uh, the Terranea project. Um, and in the process of that, I've been talking to uh, Bob Lowe, trying to guide his uh, project into more of a environmentally friendly, sustainable project. Got involved with Todd Major in the landscaping uh, aspect, uh, encouraged the use of bioswales and uh, uh, water quality improvement projects and low uh, water drought tolerant plants, which are native plants for the area. I think, um, you know, our the, both the Lowe family and our development team acknowledged from the onset that uh, you know, the site that Terranea sits on was a very special place, uh, 102 acres bound on three sides by the ocean. Uh, to the north we had the, uh, the NCCP, the, the, pres the preservation uh, land with the coastal sage scrub, uh, great right. habitat for gnatcatcher and whatnot. So we, we, we understood the, the sensitivities of, of, of developing the land and I think we also understood that we 
had one chance to get it right. Uh, and, and whatever we uh, ultimately built, it had to be uh, contextually sensitive. Uh, one would be the, the uh, 14 acres of native habitat that ring uh, the exterior of the site. Uh, it, the, the plant material was grown by the Palos Verdes Land Conservancy. Uh, our biologists have uh, seen the El Segundo Blue Butterfly, uh, seen gnat catchers, so we know the success, the, the success of that habitat. The stormwater management plan is, is by far one of the most state-of-art, uh, state-of-the-art systems uh, for sure in the South Bay, if not uh, Los Angeles County. 75% uh, of, of, of all water that flows through, through, through Terranea is, is treated before it hits the ocean. This is the type of project the city should be looking toward is a, is a, um, a partnership with private business for this kind of project that is good for the community, not only for, in terms of financial business, but in terms of the environment and sustainability of the communities themselves. So this is a great example of that that should be a model for other cities to follow. Move over banana bread. Tanya Rush shows us how to make a quick and easy apricot bran bread that everyone will love. Now, some of you may be saying, Apricot bran bread? I'm not sure about that, but don't judge before you actually try. This is a very delicious, healthy bread with a subtle taste of the apricots, and you can't even tell the bran is in there. So see, you can eat good and enjoy a good piece of bread, get a lot of fiber at the same time. Now, I've been cooking up this bread for a really long time and even liked it as a young girl. Kids like this, so that's good. And actually, this is one of my first recipes I learned in my foods class in high school out of... Thermopolis, Wyoming. Now to start, of course, you need to heat your oven to 350 degrees. And here's what you need. You actually need to um, snip some dried apricots, as I have here. You want to pour boiling water over these. And you want to let those, just set those to the side as we get, we have to prepare a few other things. Now the next thing that you want to, to do is actually you're going to take um, some egg and you're going to mix that together with some milk. And we want to soak our bran. And this is about a cup cup and a half of bran and it's bran cereal. You can use any kind that you like. Let's go ahead and mix that together just until moist and we'll also set that to the side. It's kind of a three-part thing here but it's so easy. Have your kids help you. This is also a fun activity for the weekend. Also a great snack for the kiddos and for the entire family for that matter. Okay, we're done with that part. Then the other part we need to get ready here of course is all of the dried ingredients and you want to put those all together and stir them up so it's all consistent there. All right, now because the magic of tea, we'll pretend that time has passed. You want to make sure that at least these apricots sit for about 10 minutes. You want to drain off the excess water as so, like that. Nice and, nice and good there. Put that back in. Also, we're going to sprinkle these little guys with a little, little, just a little bit of sugar. Okay, and we'll toss that to coat as so. We'll do that quickly here. There we go. Okay, now that that's ready, we're going to go ahead and we're going to actually pour this into the mixture. I like to do it in this order, not quite as messy. And if you've been following me with Meals in a Rush, you know I can make quite the mess as a chef. So we'll coat those as is, and then we're going to add the bran mixture. And uh, once this, you know, you set this to the side, you want it to get nice and soft here. So we're going to go ahead and pour that in. Voila. You know how the kids in the kitchen, they love to mix. So the more bowls you have and the more things you can put in and have them a part of it makes it for a fun time for the entire family. We're going to mix this all together till it's nice and coated. And you're going to notice that it is a thicker type of a consistency with this bread. And don't let that worry you because that's actually what, what you're going to need with this. And it cooks up so perfectly. I just love the consistency of this. So we're going to pretend that this is actually all done. We're going to set this to the side. And you want to make sure, also, oh, another secret here, when you're measuring out dried products, always use a measure device like this. Don't use the kind that you do the liquid in. Always sift your flour. A lot of people forget that stuff and it does actually make a huge difference. So don't forget to do that. All right, you're going to grease your 9 by 5 loaf pan, as so. And you would pour this, of course, into that, and you're going to bake this bread for probably about an hour. And with this bread, what I, like to, what I like to do is the old technique of once it gets closer to the time being done, 
take it a little bit out of the oven. We don't want you to burn yourself and kind of do that, that, that press on top, press slightly. And if it springs back and doesn't feel gooey, as I like to say, then you know that it's done. And there you have it. Look at this. And once it comes out of the oven, I like to sprinkle a little extra sugar on top. Gives it a little bit of a sweet touch. And if you look at this, it's just a beautiful color. You want to bake till it's light, a light brown like this. And let me tell you, it's so good if you warm it up, of course, and you put a little bit of margarine on it, especially with fall in the air and it getting a little bit crisper outside. Um, it makes for the perfect treat. So there you have it, an easy and delicious apricot bran bread. So you go out and enjoy the meals in a rush way. And I'm going to eat now, my favorite part of all of this.